So we're just continuing in this message series, and I wish that it was more profound. I wish it was more creative. I wish I could have come up with something unique. But in this message series, there's only one thing I want you to know. One thing that I want you to believe. One thing that I want you to trust in. So we've named this series, God's Got This. There's nothing else I want you to know. There's nothing else I want you to learn. There's nothing else I want you to believe than that phrase. I want you to remember it. I want you to to write it down. I want you to take a picture of it because when we face the difficulties and, and the challenges of life, I just want to remind you today that that God's got this. God's in control. God's in charge. God's on the throne. He's, he knows what you need. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're feeling. 2020's been a rough year. Do I need to rehash all the things we've been through this year? No. And just to add a little icing and cherry on top, We had a presidential election, and 68 plus, I forgot, I lost track of the numbers, 68 million people are not happy today, and half of our church isn't, but that's okay, because God's on the throne, he's in charge, and regardless of what you believe or what side you choose, we're... I don't want to sound political, but we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all Americans, or we're all here, united by our faith and love in Jesus. And the sun did rise on Wednesday morning, and we all had to go to work and pay our bills and had to mow my lawn. It didn't mow itself. I had to mow my lawn, and... Collect the leaves, and life goes on, doesn't it? Regardless of what you're facing today, I just want you to know God's got this. Last week, I began a series talking to you about trusting God no matter what. Let me encourage you. Stay connected to TC. Listen to the messages. Um, Go to our website. We have a podcast, YouTube channel. Every which way we can get it to you, watch the message, trust God no matter what. Today I want to talk to you about the faith struggle, the struggle of faith, the faith struggle. A few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to check something off of my bucket list. It was amazing. I was invited to join a a few pastors, and we went up to the Adirondacks. It was like a pastor's retreat, a pastor's recharge I so needed it for my soul. And, and while we were there in the second day, the pastor that put this together said, hey, guys, guess what? We got access to a helicopter. What? And I was like so amped and excited, but it's 2020. I don't want to get on a helicopter. <laughs> now, if it was 2019, ain't no problem with that. But it ain't 2019, it's 2020. But, you know, the pastor went around, how many are in? All these other pastors like, I don't know, I don't know. The men of faith, right? I don't know about that. Some of them turned it down, but when it came to me, heck yeah. I'm getting on that helicopter. Honey, do you know where our life insurance plan is, just in case? It's true, it's true story. I was nervous. I wish I could tell you that I was full of faith. But at that moment, I was full of anxiousness. I was full of excitement, but I had a little fear. But I managed to overcome my fear with some faith and get on that helicopter. Y'all ready to go on a ride? Let's check it out. Live footage.
You know, getting into that helicopter required a lot of faith, not just in God, but in that pilot. I didn't know that pilot for anything. I, I did ask him some questions before because that, that airport looked a little sketchy. Am I right? That was an airport. And he pulled out the helicopter with a lawn tractor. Let me tell you, it took a lot of faith. So I did ask him how many years he's been doing this. And oh, 30 plus years. Okay, check. Did, you get, did he have any drinks today, I asked him. <laughs> honest to God, Lord is my honest to God. He said, no, he didn't check. Okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Now it's up to me. Who's first? Not me. You're first. They got first. Came back safe. Okay, let's get on this thing. And I enjoyed the ride of my life. It really was an incredible, incredible ride. But you know what? We place our lives in the hands of humans all the time. I mean, if you're taking a flight anywhere, you're placing your faith in a pilot whom you do not know. You place your, your life in the hands of a, a bus driver if you take a bus, or a, or a conductor if you take a train, or maybe a physician, or a doctor, or a nurse, or sometimes we place our faith in money and possessions and things, right? And, and what I began to think about as I kind of writing out this series, God's got this, and, and, and really kind of wrestling through the faith struggle, I began to think about this. I, I, I began to realize that we place our faith and trust in people who always have the potential to fail us, because how many know that guy could have failed me, right? That pilot could have failed me. And why is it that we place our faith and trust in people and things that have the potential to fail us, and struggle to place our faith in God who promises never to fail us. Why is that? Why is the struggle real? Why, why do we struggle in our faith sometimes? And, and if you're here today and say, well, Pastor, I don't struggle in my faith. Well, well you will. Because we all do. How many struggle with their faith this year alone? I mean, 2020, this is the year we all struggle with our faith. When they close the church door, we, we all struggle. We're struggling right now for many of us. And, and, and I began to think, like, to myself, as I began writing this, I began to think, why is it so much easier for me to jump into a helicopter and trust a stranger with my life than trust the one who gave me life? You began to think about that. Why is it so much easier to trust a stranger with my life? And we do it all the time, yet God wants us to trust him the way we trust pilots, the way we trust our doctors, the way we trust those in authority over us. But we struggle to do that. Why? Why do we struggle to trust in God? Why do we struggle to trust in God? Well, well, number one, we struggle in trusting God because what we see doesn't line up with what God said. Doesn't that cause us to mistrust God sometimes? God, I prayed. I thought this was supposed to get better. God, I thought the outcome was going to be this way. God, I thought you were going to take care of me. I thought you were going to provide for me. I thought you were going to heal me. God, you promised, you said, you, you said, you said, you said. And what when, when we see doesn't line up with what God said, we struggle with our faith. God, I thought you were going to heal my marriage. I thought you were going to restore my relationships. I thought, God, you were going to do this work in my life. I thought, God, you were going to give me this job. I thought I was going to get this job promotion. And when life doesn't work out the way we want it to work, we struggle with our faith. Because we're attached to certain outcomes. We're attached to, to certain ideas. We, we're attached to, to wanting things the way we want them. And when life doesn't go our way, we doubt God. The scripture tells us that this walk and journey of life that we are all walking on and working in, it, it's not a, a walk that we walk by sight. Scripture says that we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. In other words, we don't walk by what we see we walk by what we see, not with the carnal eyes, but with our spiritual eyes, by faith. By faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. We trust God in this journey of faith. It's a journey of faith in which we're trusting Jesus every step of the way. And things will come at us that 
will confuse us, that will throw us off, but we continue to trust God and walk by faith. So we struggle to trust God because we, of what we don't see lines up with what God says. We also struggle because we don't have the patience to wait, to wait for the promise, to wait for God to come through, to wait for God to answer. We have an issue waiting, don't we? We live in this like fast food, microwave society. I can remember when the microwave first came out. How many remember that? And I remember my friend said, you could cook a hot dog in 30 seconds. I'm like, what? How could that be? Because when I grew up, cooking a hot dog meant you boil the water first. How many know what I'm talking about? Boil the water. Then you throw those fat hot dogs in, and they boil until they pop open. It usually takes about 10 minutes, but 30 seconds. Are you kidding me? And it's really trained our minds and our, and our lives to, to want things instantaneously here and now. And when God promises to do something or we want God to do something, we want it yesterday. Am I right? We want it to happen yesterday, and we don't have the patience to wait, and therefore we mistrust God. We, we, we lose our trust in God because it doesn't happen as quick as we want it to happen. You know, we, we don't have the patience to wait. And this is what happened to Abraham in the Scriptures. Abraham, we're going to talk a little bit about Abraham. He was a father of the faith, yet Abraham struggled to believe in God's promises. Abraham struggled to believe because he didn't have the patience to wait. So God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and this is the promise that God spoke to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I will what? Make you. I should have highlighted that word. Make you. You see, God is more interested in making you and shaping you than giving to you, right? God is going to make him. He didn't say, I will give you a great nation. I'm going to make you. The making requires a process. Oftentimes, God is working in our life through a process, and it's a slow process. We have a microwave mentality. The problem is we serve a crock pot God who likes to slow simmer things, right? He likes to kind of let things cook over time. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. This is God's promise to all of us. I'm going to make you great, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. This is the reason why God blesses us. God blesses you to be a blessing. That's why God blesses us, and this is why God was blessing Abraham. This is the promise in Genesis 12. Two, so Abraham started his faith in God. We read later on that he went south and just went to a place. He didn't know where he was going, but he followed God, okay? And we learn through Abraham's life that God is more interested in growing us than giving to us. And this year has been a year of growing. We've all been growing. God has been fertilizing our faith. How many know that? In order for our faith to grow, he uses fertilizer. And I don't know about you, but fertilizer stinks sometimes. Do you smell the stench of 2020? Like, yeah. Some of you that drive by those farms, you know, those farms out in the country that smell like fertilizer, that's been a little bit of a stench of 2020. But how many know fertilizer is good sometimes? Fertilizer is growing our faith, and that's what God has been doing, and that's what God was doing in the life of Abraham. Growing our faith. So he allows fertilizer to come in to grow us so that we can become who he wants us to become. Let me ask you this question. What situations, circumstances, difficulties are you facing right now that God is using to grow your faith? I know what God is, I know what's going on to the world and to our country, but what's going on in your life? What faith struggle are you in right now? Think about it for a moment. Are you in a financial faith struggle? Marital faith struggle? Trying to buy a house faith struggle? Right? Trying to pay a rent faith struggle? Trying to get a promotion? What, what is your faith struggle? So hard to list all the things. I'm trying to nail one of them in your life. What is it that you're facing today? 
And you see, what God wants you to do is God allows those things. He doesn't cause it. He allows those faith struggles so that we can grow in our faith. Why? Because Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, there's nothing else you can do in this world to please God um, um, without having faith. Faith is what's necessary to please God. Without faith, you cannot please God. Sometimes we think it's our outward actions that pleases God. Well, God is pleased, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what does God do? He wants to grow our faith. He wants to mature our faith. He wants us to develop our faith so that our faith can grow, so that we can please him on a greater level. So here is the Hebrews 11. He says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. So this is where Abraham's at, or Abram. It's where he's at. He's in the faith journey. God speaks to him in Genesis 12. Now we jump to Genesis 15. It will be 10 years, and he will not receive the promise as of yet. I don't know about you, but that's a long time. It's a long time, and this is what he says. Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. God, what's going to happen? What are you going to do as I continue in this struggle? As he writes, I continue childless, I want you to put your problem here. God, what will you give me for I continue in this situation, right? And that's where Abraham was at after 10 years of trusting God. God had yet to come through. So he asked God, God, where are you? Have you ever been there? God, where are you? What's going on? When are you going to show up? When are you going to answer my prayers? When are you going to step in? When are you going to bless me? How many have been praying, Lord, when are you going to bless me? I've been in this trial too long. I've been in this struggle too long. I've been in this difficulty too long. I've been in this, this problem way too long. God, when are you going to bless me? It's okay to ask God that. And God responds to Abram, and this is what he says in Genesis 15, I think it's 5. He says, and he brought him outside the Lord and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. I love this verse because God reminds him. He says, he says, Abraham, chill out. Relax. Chillax. Take a chill pill. Sit back because I got you. I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. And he says, Abraham, look up. Look at the stars. I want to remind you that, the, that, that if you look towards the heaven and number the stars and you're able to number them, that's how your offspring is going to be. And I love this reminder because he, he presented Abram or Abraham with this promise that he could be reminded of every single day of his life. Every night when he walked outside and looked at the stars, he was reminded of God's promise. Every day. And God wants to remind you of his promises every single day. Every single day, he wants you to pick up the book of promises called the scriptures. And in the scriptures, God wants to remind you through his word every day that he promises never to leave you, never to forsake you, that he will provide for you, that he will be there for you, that he will help you, that he will strengthen you, that he will walk with you, that even though you walk through the shadow of the, uh, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because God is with you and he'll prepare a table before you in the presence of, the, of, of your enemies and surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. So you will rather dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Bible is loaded with the promises of God. And God wants to remind you today that in spite of what you're seeing, in spite of what you're going through, in spite of the challenges that you're facing, that God is there and he will remain faithful to be there for you and that he's there with you. So don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give in to doubt. Don't give in to fear. God is with you. He's there. So, so chillax. Turn to the person next to you. Don't breathe on them, but try to whisper. Take a chill pill. Can you do that? Put it on the chat. Take a chill pill, everybody. Relax. God's in control. God's got this. He's okay. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Woo! Whew. I'm getting out of breath up here. So, Abraham got this promise. It's like, yeah, I'm going to wait. Wrong. He doubts. So he decides to try to 
fulfill the promise on his own. Abraham, known as a man of faith, he's called Father Abraham. I don't know if you ever grew up in church. How many grew up in church? I don't know. They sang a song, Father Abraham, how many sons, many sons. Have. People are logging off right now so fast. <laughs> They're like, what is happening at TC.Live? I am one of them, and so are you. Let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, Father Abraham, how many sons? Yes. Father Abraham, that Father Abraham, he had many sons, but he doubted the promise of God. So him and his wife, Sarah, they get together and say, let's just make this happen on our own. So, so, so he, she offered him her servant. You know he wasn't going to say no. Come on now. All right, Sarah, if that's what you want, fine. So he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant, has a son named Ishmael, but that was not God's promise because they didn't do it God's way. That wasn't God's promise. And Ishmael caused all kinds of problems. Do you know that we give birth to Ishmael's all the time? We produce Ishmael's all the time. How do we produce Ishmael's? First of all, we produce Ishmael's all, our, all the time when we push our will instead of waiting on God. We push what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and we get up in a mess, and God is sitting there like, well, that's what you created. You couldn't wait for the right one. You couldn't wait for the right house. You couldn't wait for the right job. You couldn't wait for the right car. You couldn't wait for the right of anything. So you decided to make things happen. You created an Ishmael. Ishmael represents this. Let me see if I find it here. Um, Ishmael represents dependency on the flesh, oneself, things, and people. They were depending on themselves, their flesh, on things, and people. We do that all the time. When we depend on ourselves, the flesh, and people, we produce Ishmael's in our life. So, so here, Ishmael produced when we push our will instead of waiting on God. Secondly, Ishmael's are produced when we seek to maintain control rather than releasing control to God. I got to control the outcome. I got to control my life. I got to control the situation. I got to control the problem. I got to control the situation. I got to be in control. I got to be in control. How many need to be in control? How many need to drive when you're on a long trip? You need to be the driver. Come on now. I could tell the control freaks because they don't even raise their hand. They're like, you're not going to tell me what to do. I raise my hand when I want to raise my hand. I'm in control. Pastor, don't control me. Okay? Let me say it again. How many, how many like to be in control? We all, a lot of us are, right? A lot of us, not all, but a lot of us like to be in control and we conduct our life that way. Like we got to be in control of everything in life. And this is the point this is what I've learned as I'm growing older, that the gr older I grow, the more I realize I control nothing. And what I need to do is relinquish control to God. We produce Ishmael's number three when we trust in other people and things instead of God. We're trusting in the flesh. We're trusting in things. We're trusting in people, and we produce Ishmael's. Ishmael's bring confusion. Ishmael's bring pain. Ishmael's bring anxiety. Ishmael bring consequences. Even to this day, Ishmael's wreaking havoc in the world. So thankfully, Abraham and Sarah realize their mistakes. And they go back to the drawing board and they realize that they had messed up. So once again, they place their faith and trust in God. And now, 24 years later, Abram is now 99. No child, no children. I believe they relinquish control to God. I believe they say, God, we trust your plan. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I trust you. Why does God wait so long sometimes? Like God speaks to him in Genesis 12. He's 75, and, and he could have just made it happen that next year because God is more interested in making him and growing him than giving to him, but also 
God wants you to get to the point where you're not depending upon anything or anyone else, and your dependency is solely on God. And when God answers that prayer, you're going to realize that it was God and not you. God and not your flesh. God and not your ability. God and not your talents. God and not your giftings. God and nothing else but God. So here is Abram. He's 99. And I don't know, I haven't met many 99-year-old guys, but I could only guess that at 99, Things don't really work at that time in your life. You know what I mean? I know there's kids in the room, but yeah. How many agree on that? Like 99? Some of y'all are saying 90, 59. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's keep going. Go. Go, Pat. Go, Joe. Go, go, go. All right. So 99. So he's good as dead, the Bible says. And his wife is, is 90. 90. And God shows up to Abraham. Thank you, Jesus. And says, about this time next year, you're going to give birth to a son. He is your promise. He is the promise. I told you. I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then the angel of the Lord said this verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says this in Genesis 18, verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I just want to declare that over your life, that there is nothing too hard for God. We serve a way maker, a miracle worker, promise keeper. We serve a God who can turn water into wine. He serve a God who make the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. He's a God that can provide. He's a God that can guide. He's a God that can do the impossible. He can speak things into existence. He can speak healing into your life. He can mend broken relationships. There is nothing too hard for God. Nothing. And that's what God wanted Abraham to know. And church, this is what God wants you to know today, that there's nothing too hard for him. Nothing. Nothing too hard for God. So Abraham, we're later, and Sarah, we're later recorded in the book of Hebrews, the same chapter 11 that we read earlier, as being great people of faith. And they received what God had promised because they believed. How did they overcome their faith struggle? And this is what I want you to know. This is what I want you to write down. I don't have it on the screen, but let me tell you. How did they overcome their faith struggle? How do you overcome your faith struggle? Simple. With faith. Say, Pastor, that don't make sense. I know it doesn't. It requires faith. You say, well, I don't have much faith. That's okay. Because scriptures say, if you have the faith the size of the mustard seed. What do you do when you're in a faith struggle? You dig deep. You dig deep. And you say, God, I love how Thomas said it. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help me. You know how you overcome your faith struggle? You, you don't just have faith. You, you just exercise helicopter faith. It's easy for us to have faith in a pilot. Four quick steps. Let's have a little fun. Four quick steps to having helicopter faith. Okay? Because this is where some of you are right now. First of all, you need to check the pilot's credentials. How many know that's it's important? <laughs> like, have you been drinking? No. Good. How long have you been playing? But let's talk about not just the pilot. This is capital for God. Okay? We're going to check God's credentials. How do we do that? We look into his word. And the thing is this, you cannot trust someone if they have not been trustworthy. And God has proven time and time again that he is trustworthy. 
Who has given you breath in your body? Who has provided for your needs? Who gave you a pillow to sleep on? Who's put food in your belly? Who's brought you this far? If God has brought you this far, he's not going to fail you. He will never fail you. God, it's impossible for God to fail you. Scripture says even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's his credentials. Check his credentials. Well, this pilot... I know what his word says. I know what I've experienced. So, so once you check his credentials, then you have to have a little faith. And number two, you got to get into the cabin. Am I right? I don't know what you call it in a helicopter, but I just use the word cabin. If that, is that right? You just get into the cabin. How do you do that? You surrender. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you. Some of you right now are on the ground, you're looking at the helicopter of faith, and you're like, I don't know if I want to get into that cabin. And God is saying, trust me. Give me your life. Put your life into my hands. Trust me with your son. How do I do that? Surrender. Say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I surrender my heart to you. Forgive me of my sins. Because I don't want to be left behind. Do you? I don't want to be left behind. I want to, I want to go riding with Jesus. I want to go riding. And if you're going to go riding with Jesus, you got to get into that cabin. And, and then once you've surrendered your life to Jesus, say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give you my life. I surrender. Then you're going to take another step. You ready? Step number three. You're just going to say, Jesus... Take control. Thank you, Jesus. Because it would have been ugly if I would have let Jesus lead us, or if I would have let the pilot just lift me, and then I'm like, I got it from here, bro. I got it, bro. I got this. I play this on Xbox. I, I, I've done this before. We would have been doing this, like, right? That's, this is a picture of some of our lives right now. You're like, Jesus, I thought if I got in with you, you were going to lead me. Yes, but you're in, trying to gain control. Just, 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 somebody, just, everybody close your fists. Ready? Just, just let go. Let go. You know what's beautiful about that trip is that I thought it was going to be rough and turbulent, and it was beautiful. It was smooth. It was peaceful. It was beautiful. But in order to get to those places, you have to release control of your life to God, release of your circumstances to God, and say, Jesus, take control. Can you say that with me, Jesus? Take control. After all, he's the pilot. He's in charge. He knows where he wants to take you. And there couldn't have been. We could have traveled for hours and hours, and there would not have been one bad view. How many know that? Any view from that location was gorgeous. That's the way it is with God if you let him take control. And lastly, step number four as we end, relax or chillax and enjoy the ride. Because Jesus will take you places you've never been and do things in your life you never thought he can do and bring you to heights and places you never dreamed you would ever be. Jesus. The scripture says, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary and walk and not faint. Right? How do we overcome our faith struggle? With faith. So let me ask you this as we close. What area of your life is God asking you to trust him in? Where is God saying, relax? I got this. Matter of fact, he's probably saying this to us. I got this, bro. I got this. I got this, bro. I got this, bro. Is that how you do it? Corey, how you do it? Got this, bro.
got you. He's got you. Got you, Latoya. Lawanda. 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 God's got you. God's got you. God's got you. He's got it. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. you. We didn't end this way first service. They were a little quiet. Can we all stand this service? Can we just lift our hands to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus, because you got me. Come on now. Let's give God some praise. Come on now. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you hold the world in your hands. Thank you, Lord, because you hold our lives in the palm.